In this video, we're gonna be looking at the stages of aerobic cellular respiration. The purpose of this process is obviously to generate a whole bunch of ATP that can essentially provide energy to the cell. Now, aerobic cellular respiration is broken down into three main steps. We need to know where each step occurs, as well as the main purpose of those steps and the products and requirements. So we start with glycolysis. Glycolysis is the first step of cell respiration, and it actually takes place entirely in the cytoplasm of the cell. The products of glycolysis are then able to move into this intermembrane space of the mitochondria. That's where the linking reaction occurs. The linking reaction takes the products of glycolysis and transforms them into a molecule that can actually enter the matrix of the mitochondria. That is where the second part of step two takes place. We call it the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle produces some molecules which will fuel the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain actually takes place across this inner mitochondrial membrane and then eventually ends up producing, like I said, a bunch of ATP for the cell to use. So let's look at each of these steps in a bit more detail. Glycolysis starts with a molecule we should be familiar with. It is a six carbon compound called glucose. Now we obviously obtain glucose by eating things. Um, plants, however, which also perform cell respiration, create their own glucose through photosynthesis. So the main purpose of glycolysis is actually to take this glucose molecule and transform it into a molecule called pyruvate. The first reaction that allows that to occur is the reaction of glucose with two molecules of ATP. So actually, in order to generate ATP in our final stage, we need a small input initially. The reaction between glucose and ATP is going to end up splitting that six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules, which we should also be familiar with. The name of those are G3P. So our first reaction in glycolysis generates two molecules of G3P. Again, we want to transform those into pyruvate. So in order to do so, each of those need to react with a molecule called NAD+. And that is what is going to produce our pyruvate. We're going to use a series of triangles to represent pyruvate. Some of the byproducts of this reaction between G3P and NAD plus include ATP. So each of those reactions actually generates two more ATP molecules. And then we also get another molecule, which we haven't really talked about yet. It's called NADH. Now, NADH will be used eventually, once we get to the very end of our cycle, to help power this electron transport chain. For now, the important molecules we need to be keeping track of are the ATPs. So since we produced two from each of these reactions, that gives us a total of four ATPs produced. However, since we needed an input of two ATPs to start up the cycle, we actually have a net production of two ATPs as a result of step one, glycolysis. So like I said, the main goal of glycolysis is to produce this molecule here. Pyruvate is the molecule that will actually be able to enter the mitochondria and undergo the Krebs cycle. One last thing to keep in mind about glycolysis is you'll notice we still haven't used any oxygen. Oxygen is obviously one of the requirements of cell respiration, but glycolysis is considered to be an anaerobic process because no oxygen is required. So moving into the linking reaction, these pyruvates that were produced are now going to enter the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. 
Now, before they can enter the matrix and undergo the Krebs cycle, these pyruvates need to be modified into a molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. So that is the main goal of the linking reaction, is to take the pyruvate molecules we made in step one and modify them a little bit to make acetyl coenzyme A. So each pyruvate molecule, like I said, will enter that intermembrane space of the mitochondria, and it is going to react once again with this molecule called NAD+. The result of that reaction is going to be a two carbon compound, some carbon which joins with oxygen to produce CO2, and another one of those NADH molecules, which we will use for later. The next part of this linking reaction, so if you wanna break them into steps, here's step one. Step two of this linking reaction takes the two carbon compound that we created and it binds it to an enzyme called coenzyme A, or CoA for short. That is what produces that molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. This is the molecule that can actually enter the matrix to undergo the Krebs cycle. So again, that molecule's name is acetyl coenzyme A. And that is the main product of that linking reaction. So now acetyl coenzyme A can move into the matrix and the Krebs cycle can begin. Now, before we move on to the Krebs cycle, a couple of things to keep in mind about this linking reaction. Because carbon dioxide was produced, that actually means that this step requires oxygen. When we took this three carbon compound and broke it down into two, there was an extra carbon just hanging around. It actually binds with oxygen and then releases CO2 as a byproduct. So the linking reaction is aerobic. If there's no oxygen present for the cell, it cannot move from glycolysis into the linking reaction. The other thing to keep in mind here is back in step one, we actually made two molecules of pyruvate. So this linking reaction occurs twice, one for the first molecule of pyruvate and a second time for the second molecule. So we actually get two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A, which move into the matrix for the Krebs cycle. Now, the main purpose of the Krebs cycle is to take these molecules of acetyl coenzyme A and put them through a whole bunch of really complex reactions to produce two molecules. They are called high energy molecules, NADH, which we've actually made some of already, and FADH2. Those two molecules will be used to power the electron transport chain. Now, luckily for us, we don't need to know the reactions of the Krebs cycle in too much detail. We just need to understand the general overview. So we start with our acetyl coenzyme A that we made over here, and it's going to undergo a few different reactions. One of the reactions requires an input of three of those NAD plus molecules. It also reacts with a molecule of FAD, and then finally, a molecule of ADP. So those are the reactants involved in the Krebs cycle. And again, a little more complicated than we're making it out to be, but we just need to know the overview. So through those different reactions, we do produce three molecules of NADP, or sorry, NADH, we produce one molecule of FADH2. We produce another molecule of ATP. And again, we release a little bit of carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So because we're making CO2 again, that means the Krebs cycle is also an aerobic process. It requires oxygen.
And we can see we've also made a little bit of ATP from this process, so that brings our total to three. However, if you recall, there's actually two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A, so the Krebs cycle occurs twice which means we now have two ATP produced from one of these Krebs cycles. That brings our total to four ATPs so far from the first two steps of aerobic respiration. So still not that many, but that's gonna be the main job of the electron transport chain. Now, like I said, the main purpose of the Krebs cycle is to produce these two molecules here. Those are super important because they are actually going to move to step three to power the electron transport chain, which is the final step of aerobic respiration. So our final step of aerobic cell respiration, like I said, is the electron transport chain. This should look a little bit familiar because it is similar to the ETC that we see in photosynthesis. Um, so just for some context, the electron transport chain takes place across this inner mitochondrial membrane. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take these high energy compounds, they are going to donate electrons to move along this electron transport chain. We're going to pool hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space, and then we're eventually going to use that hydrogen ion gradient to pump those hydrogen ions back into the matrix and generate some ATP. This molecule should look a little familiar because this actually represents ATP synthase. So starting out with those high energy molecules that we produced initially in the Krebs cycle, we have a little bit of NADH and we also have FADH2 Again, high energy molecules. Which are going to end up energizing electrons in the first intermembrane protein of the electron transport chain. So now this electron has gained energy. It is going to be passed through the series of other carriers until it finally reaches this last part of the electron transport chain. Now, as it is being passed along those molecules in the ETC, that electron is going to release some energy, which is going to be used to generate some hydrogen ions. So hydrogen ions begin to build up inside this intermembrane space. So lots of hydrogen building up in this intermembrane space here. Now, eventually when that electron reaches the end of the electron transport chain, it is actually going to bind with one final electron acceptor, which is oxygen. So oxygen binds to the products of that electron transport chain and then is used to create one final byproduct, which would be water. So the electron transport chain is also aerobic. It requires oxygen, but instead of the oxygen binding to carbon like it does in the previous two steps, oxygen actually binds to some of these hydrogen ions and is used to create water as a byproduct. So instead of releasing CO2, we release some water vapor. Now, these hydrogen ions that we're building up inside this intermembrane space, through the process of chemiosmosis, they are going to be pushed through this molecule called ATP synthase. Now, they are going to help reduce a DP to another molecule we are familiar with called ATP. And we actually get approximately 34 Four ATP molecules from that reaction. So all of these hydrogen ions that were being produced as a result of these reactions, they move back into the matrix, react with ADP and reduce it to ATP, and that's how we produce all of this ATP for our cell to use. So if you're keeping track, we did create two ATP in glycolysis. 
we created another two ATP in the Krebs cycle, and lastly, we made 34 ATP molecules in the electron transport chain. That gives us a total of 38 ATPs from just one initial molecule of glucose. And that's how our cells are able to generate energy through the process of aerobic cell respiration.